This is the Human Action Podcast with your host, Jeff Deist. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Human Action Podcast coming at you this week in audio-only format. I'm your host, Jeff Deist. I'm fighting a bit of flu this week, and my co-host, Dr. Bob Murphy, is continuing to unpack boxes uh, in his new home in Florida. So we thought we would bring you a recent interview I did with my friend Jose Nino on his own podcast called El Nino Speaks, and he was kind enough to allow us to use the audio. We go through a, really an excellent, no-holds-barred, hard-boiled wrap-up of everything that happened in 2022 on the political, economic, social, cultural landscape, and we make some pretty interesting predictions about what might be on tap for 2023. So I know you will enjoy this conversation between me and my friend Jose Nino, and we'll be back next week for a special New Year's episode episode of the Human Action Podcast. Stay tuned. We're back with another episode of El Nino Speaks. Today, I'm delighted to bring back the estimable and irrepressible president of the Mises Institute, Jeff Deist. What's new with you, Jeff? Hey, good morning, Jose. It is great to talk to you. It's been about a year. Yeah, it sure has. So yeah, obviously, 2022 is drawing to a close. And this year has been filled with a multitude of explosive political and economic events. What are your initial thoughts about how 2022 has played out thus far? Well, it's been pretty remarkable to see, I think, the acceleration of a trend that I really enjoy, that I've identified, which is basically that democratic politics is dropping its pretenses. And what I mean by that is that people who clamor endlessly about our sacred democracy, which is to say mostly left progressives, don't really care much about it or the outcomes unless they win. So the, the more you hear someone talking about democracy, the more you know they mean that's when our guy or gal wins. And this was just – this has been happening in America uh, for some time, this idea that we're no longer pretending – that democracy creates some sort of compromise down the middle, whereas whereby neither side gets everything it wants, but both sides get a little bit, and that the far left and the far right are excluded. You know, that's that's not even a pretense anymore. What democracy creates is just this permanent bureaucratic class in DC or in your state house, which runs everything. But the politicians no longer pretend to care or represent the people who don't vote for them. In other words, it's all about just simply vanquishing the other sides through some sort of slim majority. And it, of course, with many of these elections in the midterms, we don't really know who won. I suspect there's a whole lot of cheating and, and, and obfuscation involved. But you know, we have who we have now in the Senate. We have who we have now in the various state houses uh, coming up in January. And it's just interesting to me how the mask has slipped. And I think social media, especially with Elon Musk buying Twitter, uh, you know, we've we've really laid bare what people think in their hearts. There used to be a, a stopgap between what we might think about people who don't share our politics and what we actually say publicly about them. Or if we were a loudmouth who, you know, did say certain things publicly, only people in our immediate circles could ever hear that or know that we were such a loudmouth. But social media gives us this ability to broadcast it to a, a much larger, larger audience. And so the idea of America as a democracy has been laid bare, which I think is a good thing. I like Robert Higgs term participatory fascism because we, we're clearly seeing uh, that what's at work in the United States is a, a very unholy partnership between corporate America, uh, academia and government. They're, they're all sort of part of one Borg. And so it's been a, a really interesting year. Now, I don't care particularly or begrudge the outcome of the midterms because I have no faith at all in the Republican Party to represent anything uh, like capitalism or ownership or opportunity or to actually fight the progressive virus in any meaningful way. I think Kevin McCarthy and, and uh, Mitch McConnell are loathsome characters. We ought not to root for them in this in this sort of bizarre kabuki theater, this harm ritual that we have. But it is setting up to be uh, particularly interesting for an observer like us, you know, somewhat uh, on the sidelines to, to watch what's going to happen in 2024. So we'll definitely touch upon the midterms and the GOP later on. But I want to talk about like the first like prominent event of 2022 was like Russia's 
uh, invasion of Ukraine, which provoked a pretty massive diplomatic and economic response from the collective West. And in effect, uh, Russia has been like the platform from the Western economic system. And then the military front, we're, we're seeing what is in essence a NATO proxy army in Ukraine being armed to the hilt by the West to try to give like Russia, it's like Afghanistan 2.0. And then you've got the obvious sanctions push against Russia that is actually comically blowing up in the West's face, especially in continental Europe. Um, where do you see this conflict going and what will the economic fallout from the conflict look like um, once the dust settles? Well, I don't think Russia and some of its putative allies like India and China are just going to go along with this and allow uh, for a Russian retreat uh, under some sort of terms negotiated or stipulated to by NATO and the West and the U.S. and go away like a dog with their tail between their legs. And let's not forget that along with this war, uh, what we've gotten in the United States in terms of our Western media has been a lot of amnesia in terms of our own role in prodding Russia to worry about Ukraine and to worry about Ukraine joining NATO of all crazy things and to worry about NATO encircling the, the former Soviet republic. So that, you know, the idea that uh, Russia is just the aggressor, Ukraine is the wholly innocent victim and that uh, this is entirely black and white is, is of course false. And we see now almost a year later that Zelensky has become almost comical. He's coming to, to the United States with hat in hand uh, to get money from Congress, another 40 or $50 billion to add to the over, roughly $100 billion he's gotten. So this is, this is not a guy who's asking nicely either. I mean, no, nobody seems to ask the fundamental question, what's in all this for us? Why would we care necessarily if Ukraine uh, – at least, or at least the the Russian speaking uh, and culturally Russian portions of it are are part of Russia as opposed to Ukraine. Well, we shouldn't care, but unfortunately, we have this entangling alliance through NATO. Uh, it was interesting. I heard none other than Robert Kagan, a neocon extraordinaire, the other day saying that NATO is actually not very good at fighting these kind of sustained wars that require a lot of artillery, a lot of old fashioned tech. Uh, so I'm not sure that the, the, what we're getting in the Western press about how badly it's going for Russia and how well it's going for Ukraine, I'm not sure that that's true. Uh, you know, it depends on who you want to believe and who you read. And what, what are the actual numbers of Ukrainian casualties and Russian casualties? We don't know. Uh, we do know that the Russian military is probably better equipped to sustain a long and drawn out battle over Ukraine. So Unfortunately, the West in its hubris has painted Putin into a bit of a corner. Yes, he's the bad guy here. He's the aggressor. And I do think Ukraine has a separate cultural linguistic identity and ought to be its own nation. I, I'm for Ukrainian nationalism, but it's so funny that the West, which has been globalist for so long, which hates the whole concept of a nation state along ethnic or religious or linguistic uh, fault lines. All of a sudden, he cares about Ukrainian nationhood. No, the West doesn't care about Ukrainian nationhood. The West wants a, a Western puppet to be installed there to worry about things like LGBT rights and feminism and and uh, you know the U.S. dollar supremacy and all these other things. So, um, you know, how long can this can this war go on? What well, can go on a long time? And things are not at present good in Kiev. Uh, it, you know, there's uh, power outages and it's getting into the coldest part of winter now as we speak. So it's awfully easy for comfy, warm armchair quarterbacks in the United States or in Western Europe to, uh, you know, cheer on the plucky, brave Ukrainians. But at the end of the day, Jose, it, it's their fight. It's their issue. It's not our business. And I particularly don't care. Uh, for Russians in the U.S. or former Russians in the U.S. trying to drag us, uh, the West, into their literally thousand-year uh, ethnic and, and tribal conflicts. I don't appreciate that at all. On the coverage front of this conflict, it this really does tie into like the social media issues we're facing because I've mostly have gone 
to alternative channels like the Duran and like people like Alexander Mercoris for coverage on this because there you get like much better like takes on that than the corporate press, which is um, is fanatically anti-Russian. And that's been a fixture of post-Cold War politics and they're, they're always trying to turn things into like a black uh, versus white type of conflict when really this is a conf this is like a an incident of slav on slav violence thousands of miles of way that should be of no concern to us but there are a lot of people in the dc think tank industrial comp uh, complex that want to keep their make work jobs going and try to drag us into another conflict that will um keep them relevant and keep their <clears throat> allies in the military industrial complex employed well what i wonder is at what point will u.s aid and weaponry uh, be accompanied by some u.s boots on the ground or whether there are already u.s boots on the ground for training purposes for example uh that both the u.s and the ukrainians deny this but we don't know that that's the fact and and you know the united states economy which i'm sure we'll discuss uh, is in very bad shape and faces not just some headwinds in terms of of the, let's say, macroeconomic conditions and, and the economy as it is, but some really structural, deep structural issues with entitlements and with debt and with the dollar supremacy. So we don't you know, just have the money to be tossing around uh, so cavalierly in, in to uh, Zelensky and who is probably – uh, you know, all these hundreds of millions going over there, you know, who knows how they're accounted for, what's actually being purchased and whether, uh, you know, we'll have any of these uh, any of these oligarchs from whatever side come out of this w war with a Swiss bank account. Yeah, that's very likely. Uh, I could see him easily going back to his like alleged property in Miami when all of this is said and done and his pivot back to his original role as an actor. Now, um, yeah, I want to go to the midterms because that um, these midterms were quite bizarre because it was they were expected to be a total blowout for Republicans based on like historical trends of the party outside of the Oval Office making pretty solid gains, if not outright taking both chambers of Congress. And then you factor in a lot of the stuff that's going on right now, the collapsing economy rising crime, the border situation, et cetera, et cetera. It, it should have been, by all intents and purposes, a walk in the park for Republicans, but it turned into a mixed bag. You obviously saw the like, Republicans take back the House, and then Democrats expanded their lead in the Senate. What was your initial reaction to the midterm results? Well, I think it's a combination of two things. One, Republicans are almost unbelievably bad at crafting any sort of coherent message. I mean, all the problems you just uh, mentioned, along with rampant inflation, ought to allow them to have a bit of a route in both the House and the Senate, and they certainly didn't. So it was certainly a victory for the Dems. But second is that I think just a lot of the American public doesn't care about these things anymore. In other words, there's a disconnect between reality and voting. People vote almost entirely along tribal lines. And for progressives, the and for younger people, and especially for single people, uh, the Republican Party is just viewed as so toxic that it almost doesn't matter if you've got – if you live in San Francisco and have homeless everywhere, you know, or if you uh, are struggling to pay your student loans or whatever it might be. There's a disconnect now between the actual – what we used to think of as almost the mechanical functions of government like paving the streets and providing police protection – and, uh, you know, giving a, a little old lady social security checks, all these sort of mechanical functions of government, which are actually breaking down uh, across both local, state and, and federal government. Uh, those are no longer what drive people to vote. I mean, even their own pocketbook issues are not the primary driver anymore. We're, we're living in a bit of a suspension of disbelief. It's kind of a bizarre pseudo reality where – we just want to reward our side and punish the other side. And I think this is all psychology. Uh, there's still a lot of hangover here about Trump. People on the left, even moderate Democrats, just hate him so much that they feel that the GOP has to be vanquished, at least for a few decades, 
to learn their lesson that we can never, ever, ever again have someone like Trump elected president. And so I think um, we are on the cusp probably, depends of course on uh, demographics, but we're probably on the cusp of a Democratic majority somewhat enduring at the federal or national level. But that doesn't really mean all that much because, again, the Republicans are so bad, they've moved so far left, that what you'll have in effect is a left and right wing of the uni Democratic Party. So uh, yeah. I, I, don't think, I don't think anyone who cares about I, – I don't even want to say liberty because that's become such a loaded term. But anyone who just doesn't want to live in a clown society um, should be too psychologically invested in the midterms. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you're of the like impression with the current, I take it, the current configuration of Congress and the executive branch that it's just going to be business as usual in D.C.? Oh, absolutely. 100 percent. That's the only way they can operate because of the fiscal realities that constrain them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, I see it as a uni party as well, even if like um, in a lot of like blue states, too, that have like monolithic democratic control, you do see like this, um, the more like centrist, like neoliberal pro business wing of like Democrat Party pit uh, pit against like this really weird woke um, South African style, like uh, Zimbabwe style, like redistributionist wing. It, it's going to always break down in terms of factionalism, even in so-called one party states. But the Republican alternative is just not much to right home about now i found one point you mentioned uh very interesting about like the post public policy nature of politics now where voters no longer really care um for a lot of political issues and they just vote on strictly tribalistic lines like a red tribe versus like blue tribe and are you, are you of the view that even if like Republicans were able to magically pivot to some like hybrid libertarian slash populist type of platform that it would make much of a difference or would it be like – are these like trends so ingrained that uh, people will just vote only Republican because of tribal – for tribalistic reasons? Well, the Trump phenomenon suggests that Republicans could – be a more effective populist party. Now, Trump won essentially as a third party. He had no party backing. He had no party ground game, precinct by precinct. I mean, that was all Trump. That was all social media. That was just him and a few people around him. Uh, so Trump had an R next to his name on the ballot. But in effect, he was a third party. He was the result of the Pat Buchanan's and the Ross Perot's and the Ron Paul's uh, who came before him, I think, in many ways. So yes, the Republicans could be more effective populists, but that would require the party to be overtaken by uh, the Rory Sabatini, excuse me, the Anthony Sabatini. Rory Sabatini is a PGA Tour player. Mm -hmm. The Anthony Sabatini and Blake Masters wing of the party, which it's not going to be. It's going to be controlled by the Mitch McConnell uh, uh, and the uh, weepy John Boehner a wing of the Republican Party with you know, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, uh, you know, it's so funny. Uh, Paul Gottfried wrote about this recently, how the left elevates its radicals and the, the right pushes them off to the side. So as a result, you get the most milquetoast possible leaders like Kevin McCarthy from California. I mean, California Republican, almost an oxymoron at this point. Whereas on the left, you know, Na Nancy Pelosi, who is like a dyed in the wool, like insane, crazed lefty was able to be speaker. Um, and, and of course, people like Rand Paul get shunted to the side. So uh, that is an enduring uh, feature of the left is that they're, uh, they're just more skilled at politics. They understand that the state apparatus is a tool for reward and punishment. And goofy Republicans are still wrapped up in 1985, George Will, uh, Boomer Khan, uh, constitutionalism and this sort of thing, which is which is why I I don't personally um, you know hold any water for the GOP. But yes, I think public policy is dead. It was always a pretty meaningless term. Public policy was really just politics. 
who controls the apparatus and so can get their ideological program uh, you know, further down the road. So I, I never liked the term public policy because it, it insinuates that there are these sort of neutral people in think tanks, in the administrative agencies, uh, even in, in p- amongst uh, politicians themselves and their staff who are thinking about these things not in ideological terms but in structural terms like, well, we're going to create social security back in the 30s and here's how it's going to work and we can't have too much spending. We got to have this many workers for this many retirees and that there were these sort of non-political considerations to how we come up with policy. That was never really true, but it's certainly entirely untrue today. So whenever you see somebody on Twitter, for example, with public policy in their bio, you have to disregard them immediately as an unserious person. There's just politics and and politics is force. It's a precursor to violence. It's it's a halfway form of violence, really, because people are there are winners and losers. It's zero sum by its very nature. So uh, you know what the GOP ought to be doing is learning its its at least strategic lessons from Trump, but it can't do that because um, you know it wants to be part of the game in Washington D.C. And so the reason people vote tribally, especially today, is that they have accepted a narrative that we are in an existential crisis and that MAGA represents a fascist Nazi, uh, you know undoing of our entire sacred democracy or that woke represents uh, just the unhinged, uh, um, you know, application of left-wing principles taken to their fullest and finest con- final conclusion. So there's, there's uh, I- I'm certainly, I certainly consider woke a much bigger threat than MAGA. I don't, I, I, I can't stand, uh, Lalbert types who who lack uh, the ability to view the left for what yes. it really is, which is a mm-hmm. which is a, a totalizing, all consuming, um, you know, a mindset which can't be dealt with. It can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. Uh, so, well, let me put it this way: I think Republicans are are just as bad as Democrats, but I. I don't think the right is just as bad as the left. I think the left is far, far, far worse than the right, both in terms of what it actually believes and its ability to impose those beliefs across mm-hmm. not, not only politics, but corporations, academia, uh, you know, the performing arts, literature, et cetera. Yeah, I, I agree with that point as well, because the the left is ultimately in power across the board from conventional politics to even the corporate boardroom. And that's like the existential threat. To me, The I, I view most of what I like to prove right not so much as a threat, but a major hindrance to getting any type of like meaningful opposition to this monolithic woke project that the cultural left is trying to impose. But some people prefer to take this really weird, radical centrist position on on what the actual threats are to the U.S. And yeah, it's well, lame. yes, the, I'm, this this idea of saying you're neither left nor right is like saying that in you know is like standing in the middle of a hurricane saying you know earthquakes are bad too. Yes. Well yes, earthquakes are bad too, but that's not what we're experiencing at the moment. Yes, exactly. That's a that's a great analogy. Now to go to more uh, <laughs> the economic front because this is I think like amid a lot of this culture war stuff we often forget to some of the really bad central banking policies that both parties promote that have brought us to this dilapidated economic state. Um, Obviously, inflation is in the air and it's not transitory, contrary to what many people in the bobblehead media would like you to believe. And it's not going away anytime soon. Now, what do you believe caused this current bout of mass inflation? And do you see it getting worse in the years to come? Well, it appears that the 2020s are going to look a lot more like the 1970s than any other decade in the sense that there will be persistent high inflation with little or stagnant economic growth. So that's that's a very bad combination. Yeah, I think inflation is here to stay. Now, what caused this latest spike is, of course, the massive fiscal intervention of Western governments, particularly Uncle Sam, as a response to COVID. So when you're literally putting 
trillions of dollars into the economy, not in terms of bank reserves, not in this circuitous monetization of debt process, which we saw with quantitative easing as, you know, after 2008, but actual direct fiscal stimulus. That was PPP loans to employers, uh, PPP or uh, uh, stimulus money to government, stimulus money to individuals, uh, stimulus money to big corporations like the airlines. I mean, that was actual cash cash that went into accounts and that money was spent. Uh, so that was direct M2 uh, monetary intervention at the same time when goods and services were hugely constrained as a result of the COVID lockdowns and supply chain issues. So you get lots more money chasing fewer goods. You know, that's that's just how it goes. I mean, that's uh, it, it doesn't take much to understand that. But the idea that you can just defeat this by raising interest rates, uh, mm, not so clear. Uh, Keith Weiner, Keith Weiner is a name some of you might know. Uh, he, he makes an interesting point. He's very active in, in gold and precious metal circles. But he makes an interesting point. You know, when you, when you raise interest rates, a lot of the more marginal producers that are in debt – or in debt at an older, higher, you know, or, or suddenly are, can only avail themselves of debt at higher interest rates. You know, a lot of them uh, are marginal and they go out of business. So you might actually re reduce supply uh, and, and drive prices upward as a result of raising interest rates. But the conventional thinking is that, okay, you raise interest rates to kill inflationary pressure. But, it, you know, even if that works, that comes generally at a huge cost of uh, – both business and personal uh, slowdowns, right? That's so when when people and businesses are tightening their belts, that generally uh, has a bad effect on jobs and employment. So this idea that Jerome Powell is just going to be able to engineer a soft landing, I think, is is very much in doubt. And I have I have to think that it's people who can provide real value in the 2020s are going to be the ones who prosper. And I do think hard assets are going the, – the real world, the old analog world is going to make a, a significant comeback over the next decade. And by that, I mean uh, you know, gold and precious metals. I mean oil. I mean food. I mean you know, hard commodities. Uh, the kind of thing that Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway actually invest in uh, even while they're singing the praises of uh, stock markets go – you know, number go up forever and ever. Uh, so I think the the old economy is going to reemerge as we start to realize that, uh, you know, f the idea of a Green New Deal, the idea we're all going to be driving EVs is just absolute pie in the sky and that we're just nowhere near the capacity on the electrical grid to do that anywhere in the West. And so this is just a big pipe dream. And so oil is going to have a lot more staying power. Uh, oil, coal, natural gas are going to have a lot more staying power in the real world that, than uh than our uh, climate change friends like to pretend. And so, you know, my, my advice uh, in, in all of this to, I guess, the right would be, you know, you don't do yourselves any favors by ignoring economics. This idea that, that, you know, oh my gosh, these libertarian economics have taken over the right. And what we need now is to go to go back to sort of a national conservatism with protectionist tariffs and with, um, you know, entitlements for people to have more kids and this sort of thing and, and more robust uh, public schools. You know, it, it, you know, you don't you don't fly the airplane better by ignoring gravity in its design. You can't ignore the laws and rules of economics any more than you can ignore gravity when you're trying to, to fly airplanes. So um, I think the right is pretty ill served by imagining that like the left does, that it can command and control the economy to its purposes. And more broadly, I think the right is absolutely delusional if it thinks it is ever again going to control the federal apparatus and turn it towards, you know, supposedly conservative ends. I mean, look, Donald Trump, who was a bull in a china shop, you know, who, the likes of whom will probably never be elected again, uh, couldn't do a thing. He, he couldn't do a thing to change the administrative agencies, you know, what we can call the deep state in Washington, you know, he couldn't touch the Fed. He couldn't touch entitlements. He couldn't touch defense. Uh, so, you know, I really think that uh, the the economic problems of this country, in terms of debt deficits and the dollar, are and and, and the spending mania, 
are baked into the cake at the federal level. So all the action, anything interesting, anything positive is going to be happening at the margins as usual. Uh, like almost anything in society, it's going to be happening at the state and local level. So I, I think there's a real opportunity for governors to be out there positioning themselves and and trying to protect their populations against all of these economic fallouts and to be a, a bright spot uh, in what's probably going to be a really rough decade. And to an extent during COVID, for example, DeSantis and Christy Nome were able to do that. They were able to uh, apply real federalism and keep their economies more open than many of the blue states. So I think there are going to be, you know, examples of that, uh, hopefully over the next 10 years. So if you're worried about all this, um, I would say that the action is at the state and local level. Yeah, I want to go back to the interest rate <clears throat> front because the, yeah, the conventional wisdom is if you raise interest rates, you create this like contractionary, like economic spiral that will allegedly tame inflation but there is like a supply side issue here because the regulatory state is so massive in the u.s and with covid19 like the government's response to it it's only grown more onerous so would you say that in like a hypothetical scenario where you would like like gradually like titrate interest rates upward but um deregulate the economy more would that be more effective towards curbing inflation than just like going the Jerome Powell route of just focusing exclusively on hiking interest rates? Well, I wish Jerome Powell would focus exclusively on that instead of talking about climate change and racism <laughs> and all the goofy stuff the Fed is up to now. But um, yeah, I mean, look, I think if we had a natural rate of interest, which was actually reflected the uh, time preferences of borrowers and savers, I think it would be higher even then the Fed's funds rate is today, I think it would be well over 5%. So yes, I mean, if we have to have Jerome Powell, if we have to have the Fed, I, I, I guess I do want to see them continue to raise interest rates in that, in that very narrow sense. But, um, but here's the thing. I mean, you talk about a zombie company. A zombie company is a company whose bottom line, you know, net profits are insufficient to service its debt obligations. So a zombie company isn't even making enough money after all of its expenses to pay interest on its debt. So the only way it can continue is to keep, you know, getting cheaper and cheaper debt uh, and and sort of, uh, you know, readjusting its debt load. Uh, now we have zombie countries. The United States is on the precipice of being a zombie country, which means that uh, unless interest rates, if interest rates continue to rise, very quickly, Congress will find that it's it simply uh, cannot even come close to servicing the interest on the national debt. Right now, right now, the last few years, if we look at all the outstanding Treasury debt and weight it, uh, for, you know, you can find the weighted average interest rate of all that outstanding Treasury debt. It's been very, very low. So that means even with thirty odd trillion dollars of debt, Congress has only had to spend four or five hundred billion a year on interest payments in terms of its annual budgeting. Well, it wouldn't take much to get that up over a trillion dollars very quickly and have that become the single biggest line item in the federal budget. Of course, Congress can create money. It doesn't have to raise the money in taxes. We've seen that in spades since 2008, where we've had huge deficits almost every year. So I think there are limits to that. I think at some point, the rest of the world is going to cry uncle and say, you know, if you keep doing this, if you keep spending this far above and beyond what you bring in in taxes and you you paper over the difference and use that papering to basically buy treasury debt, to create a, a market, an artificial or unnatural market for all this debt you're issuing, you know, at some point we're going to see this for the game of musical chairs that it is and say, hey, we, we, we want junk bond rates in order to keep investing in this economic calamity known as Uncle Sam. And, and remember, Jose, all this debt, this $31 trillion debt, this doesn't even get into the entitlement promises of Social Security and Medicare. Those are completely off the balance sheet. So that's, that's a separate question. But, uh, you know, zombie co companies can, you know, now we can have zombie countries. So I don't know, I don't know what the answer is for Jerome Powell. I, I don't know what can be done uh, but we ought to, you know, significantly curtail spending, get rid of some of these moral hazards, and allow interest rates, the real kind, 
the kind uh, set by the market to uh, reassert themselves. Now, that sounds about as far off as at this point, um, you know, name name whatever superhero movie you want to name. I mean, it just sounds so far from anything being contemplated that I, I worry we are going to – that we, meaning the U.S. federal government are, and our central bank, will always choose – at the end of the day, to inflate and devalue. That that's ultimately the least painful political choice among a bunch of bad choices to say, look, we're still going to pay entitlements, at least nominally. We're still going to pay interest on the debt, at least nominally, but we're going we're to try to inflate it away um, rather than ever have any significant restructuring or default. So you could have a an actual default or you can have a de facto default. And I think we're in the middle of a default e- effectively, but it just it's it happens over many, many decades in slow motion. Mm, yes, definitely. Uh, we're in for some pretty turbulent economic times to say the least. And now I want to delve into social media because the most prominent development of 2022 on that front was – Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter. Uh, the guy is an intriguing figure. He's there's obviously considerable spectis, uh, skepticism about him um, among people in free market circles due to Musk's partnerships with the government. Nevertheless, when you look at it, it does seem that the American ruling class genuinely despises the guy and wants to do everything possible to undermine him. He's a loose cannon and he's willing to stir the pot. That's something you could definitely say in his favor. What do you make of what did you make of Musk's Twitter purchase? And do you believe that it augurs well for free speech on social media? Well, what's interesting is 10 years ago, he was the darling of progressives. He was bringing us the EV future, <laughs> right? He, he, his cars were so cool. Everybody wants one. You know, if you live in San Francisco, or Los Angeles or New York, you got to have a Tesla. That was the car to have. Um, so it is interesting how viciously and how quickly the left has turned on him the minute he was not 100% in lockstep with their uh, view of him. And now that we see not only Musk, but figures like Matt Taibbi and Glenn Greenwald being termed right wing or far right, I mean, it shows you that, again, unlike the dopey, gullible right, the left isn't kidding. They're serious. They have a Leninist, you know, who, whom, us, them view of the world. And all Elon Musk and Matt Taibbi and Glenn Greenwald have to do is not be fully on board and they become them instead of us. So I think there's a, a real lesson here. Now, paying whatever he paid, $44 billion for Twitter was clearly not an economic decision. I mean, that suggests to me that maybe he really is a good guy, that he's well-intentioned and not some sort of, uh, you know, deep state plan or something like that, because to pay that much and to put up a lot of his own uh, money or to at least pledge against a lot of his own Tesla stock, he had some co-investors like Larry Ellison, by the way, that goes mostly unmentioned. But nonetheless, uh, to put up so much of his own fortune, because it suggests that this really may have been something where he just wanted to own it uh, for the sake of free speech and that he's well-intentioned. I mean, I don't know. We don't know the guy. Uh, but he's he's clearly uh, wildly overpaid. I mean, he paid something like eight or nine times revenue for the company. Not eight or nine times EBITDA, <laughs> earnings after revenue. I mean, he paid some – he grossly overpaid for the company. And look what he got for it. I mean – Um, I I certainly think Twitter's improved since he bought it, and I think it could be uh, a a great mechanism for for free speech and inquiry and interesting thoughts and ideas. You have to curate it. You have to use the block and mute function to tailor it uh, to, you know, but I've learned a lot from people on Twitter that I would never have known about absent it. So I think it's, it's a it's an interesting platform and a worthy one if he can manage to keep it or to run it correctly. I'm not sure that I, it's beyond my capabilities to understand how it becomes profitable or how you make money at it. I mean, um, the, you know, the promoted tweets are such that I, I almost immediately blank them out or X them out or whatever. Uh, could it become profitable through this $8 a month 
uh, service fee without kicking everybody off who refuses to pay. I, I, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't un- know enough to understand the economics behind Twitter. But um, you know, the fact that the reaction to his purchase of it has been so unhinged is is meaningful. It shows you that the left absolutely loses its mind when it doesn't control a platform or an institution in society. And again, Lulberts frequently forget. I mean, the left, ha- most of the left doesn't even believe this. The left doesn't even understand the 20th century is a progressive triumph. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know what you say to people. It's like you're watching two different movies. The left controls media. The left controls academia. The left controls uh, all the mainline religions, Roman Catholic Church, uh, the, all, all the big uh, Protestant branches, all the synagogues. The left controls Fortune 500 companies and their boardrooms. Uh, you know, at some point, people would just say, oh, no, no, they don't, Jeff. You're wrong. Uh, you know, at, at some point, we're just we're just not seeing the same movie, I guess. So um, – but when you consider how even a tiny crack in their iron grip on the cultural uh, uh, avenues, uh, you know, uh, like Twitter, for, for one, when they lose that iron grip even slightly, um, they completely lose their minds. And I think that's telling. I think <clears throat> a friend of mine, Peter St. Ange, who's an economist for Heritage, says – you know, th- this shows you how scared they are about their actual ideas. Um, you know, LGBT. I mean, when when did this become this huge political issue? Sex and sex- sexuality uh, aren't political matters. They aren't even public matters. <laughs> and yet we just have LGBT all day long. And I think on one hand, the the left recognizes a lot of people just, you know, just aren't that animated by this and don't really want this to be uh, – one of the defining characteristics of the political debate. Hey, let, you know, let's talk about grandma's social security or something for a second. Um, and so in, and I think in many senses, the left has overplayed its hand and realizes it, but they also can't help themselves because they are true believers. And as we've seen from progressives, I mean, they, they are fully willing to suspend disbelief and believe things that are just demonstrably, provably not true in order to to maintain fidelity to their ideology or their worldview. I mean, that's very, very difficult for people because, you know, look, I I know this is a cliche at this point. Lots and lots of people have said this, people much smarter than me, that that progressivism is a religion. And, And that's true in the sense, but cliche or not, it's true in the sense that everybody needs something to believe in. Um, and if you don't have God, you have to figure out what replaces that in society. Now, the West is, is hell-bent on becoming completely secular and is well along that road. Another example of how progressives control everything is that religious observation. Forget what people say. What they do in terms of religious observance or attending church or synagogue services is, is in absolute free fall. Um, so America is becoming secular. That is baked in the cake. Uh, absent some sort of calamity that, uh, br- you know, brings people <laughs> back to God somehow, you know, that's just how it's going to be. The West is going to be as secular as Europe over the coming decades. And so the question of what replaces that, which is, of course, Lalberts have no answer. Um, well, the answer, of course, is progressive ideology in the state. Uh, and, th- you know, people are dogmatic and, and irrational and, and highly illiberal. When it comes to that, so when you say, you know, how can these progressives continue to vote for the same f- failed policies in San Francisco when there's all these homeless people everywhere defecating on, in the street and there's needles everywhere, you can't even go downtown to the fancy stores that everybody could go to 10 years ago. Well, that, that's why, because they're not this, – this isn't a reality-based phenomenon. This is a faith-based phenomenon, and progressives are every bit as faith-based as anybody who believes in a literal – interpretation of, let's say, the biblical miracles or a literal hell or a literal Satan. Uh, progressives, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the most dyed-in-the-wool Baptist uh, that progressives would mock, he, he's got nothing on um, AOC when it comes to uh, faith-based beliefs. Yep, yeah, indeed. It, it, is a, it is a religion, and, and it's filling in a vacuum that um, is 
been created due to the rise of the managerial state that ha has created uh, that has produced this bowling alone scenario that uh, we see where civil society for all intents and purposes is moribund and you just look at church attendance all the way to participation rates in civic associations and it's pretty bad so something's going to fill that void and it's oftentimes going to be some type of broad based like state institution or really like degenerate movements such as like wokeism well but but can we just throw in a, a plug for hoppa here and he gets a lot of grief but he makes the point that you know well-being is subjective it's not only material so in almost every way uh, especially let's say modern dentistry for one but in almost every way my life is materially better than my grandfather's uh in ter right in terms of the house I live in, the car I drive, I mean, a, a Honda Accord today is so much better than the cars he drove and all that. But yet, when I think back to my grandfather from my own childhood, and I think of how much he enjoyed his cigars, I think of his he had Bridge Club. You know, every Friday night they went to somebody else's house. He had a bowling league. Um, he worked at a factory uh, where there was a little barber shop for the men, and they had you know back then it was like. $2.50 or something like that for a haircut. I mean, in many, many ways, my grandfather and his uh, colleagues were uh, happier, uh, more well-adjusted, and, and frankly, uh, felt more secure in their country uh, than I do and my colleagues do today. So, you know, just pure GDP materialism is not the only consideration. Uh, an, another huge Lalbert blind spot. Yep. Yeah. Society back then, uh, regardless of its flaws, was socially capital intensive and it was socially capital rich. Now it's uh, in terms of socially in terms of social capital, it's impoverished in many respects. And <clears throat> now, um, yeah. OK, now this is pretty much inevitable, like the talk about um, Trump's announcement to run in 2024. It, from my vague impression of um, his announcement it really felt kind of underwhelming. The the type of energy surrounding like Trump campaign in 2016 was just so different. It, it was pretty intense, but now it seems to be like receding. And you can also like feel it too in a lot of like Republican circles. They're ready to move on, and they're latching on now to DeSantis or other figures. What's um What's your impression of? Trump 2024, do you think he has a chance or do you believe that the the DC establishment will go full like banana, third world banana republic mode and try to purge him from politics altogether? Well, I think if somehow he were to be the nominee, he would lose. He would lose worse than he did last time, even to Joe Biden, first and foremost. So, uh, you know, if we if we go back to 2016, Trump had to happen. Trump absolutely had to happen because there was this arc of inevitability that which progressives believed in, again, the Whig theory of history, that, that we were going to have the first female president, it was going to be Hillary Clinton. And this was just absolutely inevitable. And we were becoming more and more and more like a Western, excuse me, like a European social democracy. And so this, this doctrine of inevitability, which animates progressives, had, had to be thwarted. Uh, so at least temporarily. I think Trump was a speed bump rather than a roadblock, but nonetheless. Uh, Brexit also had played a role in this. So there was some real psychological damage on the left when Trump won. And of course, they've behaved in incredibly badly ever since and viciously ever since and, and shown how much they truly hate and despise and want to vanquish people. Uh, so Trump, Trump had to happen and it was never about Trump. It was never about his policies, so-called. It was never about his administration, the people around him. It was just about um, punching progressives in the nose to shake them up, to, to shake their foundation of, you know, the psychology of inevitability. That, that alone was Trump's virtue. And again, that had to happen. Uh, but now, fast forward almost eight years, um, you know, Trump is, is, is badly wounded. This whole NFT thing he came out with the other day. I mean, he's really goofy. He was horrific uh, on COVID. Let's not forget that. People call Trump a fascist, 
well, there's nothing more or less fascist about Trump than Obama or W or any of these other presidents or John McCain. But one thing he did do, which which actually was fascist, uh, was to in, engage in a federal partnership with a small, tiny handful of cronyist big pharma companies who are at the, immune from lawsuit, who are patent protected, and whose uh, untested uh, technology was fast-tracked by the federal government. Now, that, folks, is corporatist fascist, uh, <clears throat> not simply not allowing open borders or something like that. So that's that was Trump's most fascist moment. So he doesn't deserve any of our support. That's first and foremost. Uh, I don't think he will be the nominee because I don't think he will be allowed to be the nominee. Uh, I think this January 6th commission, uh, which has made a, a referral for criminal charges to the Department of Justice on four counts, uh, I think that is part and parcel. That shows that progressives still fear the guy. I think they're wrong. I don't think they should fear him. I think they, in a weird sense, they should almost welcome him as the 2024 nominee again because I think he would lose – to, to Joe Biden. Um, but nonetheless, Alan Dershowitz, some other uh, constitutional scholars, I haven't yet been able to talk to Judge Knapp about this, but they've suggested that, that um, Congress does not have a constitutional role or the authority to make a criminal referral to the Justice Department. They can only uh, bring sort of a, a criminal indictment un, under the auspices of the 14th Amendment, which is not what the January 6th committee did. So there's potentially some constitutional infirmity to this whole uh, referral by the January 6th committee. But even if that uh, – even if the Justice Department sort of politely says, well, thank you, we'll conduct our own investigation, uh, it's not Congress's role, I, I think there will be more to come from the DOJ. But more importantly, there's this, uh, there's this clause under the 14th Amendment when it said, where it says somebody who has been – uh, you know, who's been engaged in insurrection against the United States cannot hold federal office. So I think there's there's a couple of avenues potentially to have him simply disqualified from the ballot. Uh, and I think maybe because it was just, again, such a psychological shock, the, the left still fears this guy. He embodies everything they hate about this country, which is basically working class whites, let's be honest, um, that they'll – do anything in their power to make sure he never gets near the presidency again. And that's that may, may well be the case. Now, DeSantis is interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, friends of mine like Tho Bishop uh, think he uh, would be a, a good president, perhaps. I, I'm not sure that DeSantis plays well beyond Florida. I think, as a matter of fact, he would play very poorly outside of Florida. And I personally wish he would just stay there and that we could have more of an experiment between the various states in terms of real aggressive federalism, call it soft secession even, after COVID with governors asserting themselves against the federal government, against the Supreme Court, its edicts, whatever it might be. I mean, I, I like that experiment a lot more than all the compromises which would inevitably come from DeSantis running for governor, excuse me, for president. And also, he, you know, he's really bad on foreign policy. He's got some neocon tendencies uh, so I, I don't really want to see that happen. I mean, there could be somebody else out there in the wings. But I mean, assuming Biden's unfit or incapable or, in, uh, you know, they just don't want to run him because he might lose. I mean, it's not like a bunch of Democrats immediately come to mind either. So um, I, I think we're I think most people are assuming it's going to be DeSantis. I think it's way early to, to suggest that. Yeah, I personally prefer that he just find a way to govern Florida in perpetuity. That, to me, it would be much more effective than him going the predictable route of ass assuming the presidency later, seeing his presidency get co-opted by all these nasty national security critters and other mainstays of conservatism, Inc. That's a very predictable path that we've seen play out before, and I don't want to see it play again. So... There's obviously a lot of instability in the system um, at the moment, and I actually do believe there is a legitimacy crisis in the U.S. when it comes to, like, its elections. Think about it. When you have two straight elections where people are heavily contesting the results and accusing the other side of engaging in foreign collusion or committing fraud, your electoral system may not be long for this world. 
Now, all things considered, where do you see the U.S. going next year and really the next decade or so? Well, I'm looking forward to one of those odd-numbered years where we don't have one of these damnable federal elections. So I'll start with that. Um, I, I don't enjoy election season. It seems inescapable. But um, it, it, unless the economy significantly improves, uh, I think 2023 will be a, a really a referendum on Joe Biden because it's going to be harder to blame Republicans for everything bad in the world. And Trump's going to be, you know, he, he'll, he'll be out there, I suppose, as uh, the putative candidate. But I don't think um, he's going to be as big as he imagines in people's consciousness, especially uh, staying off Twitter as he's elected to do, I guess, because of his own investment or interest in true social or whatever it might be. So I'm not sure Trump really hangs over the proceedings in 2023 as much as Trump imagines he's going to. And can we also just recall that you know Trump Trump's getting pretty old, just like Joe Biden to be president. He's he's really overweight, um, you know, not not in a good condition to be doing all the things he would have to do uh, to try to sort of be a foil to Biden and constantly critique Biden over the next couple of years. So I think 2023 is a year where we'll be looking uh, where, where the economy will reassert itself as the primary issue. Uh, I think the uh, all the social issues which plague us, LGBT and guns and abortion, all these things uh, where courts have too much to say, um, those will recede a bit because there's not an election and people will care more about the economy itself. Uh, so I, you know, I don't want things to get worse. Uh, you know, the Austrian perspective tends to be somewhat more vindicated in a down economy, but that doesn't make me wish for one. Um, but at, at the same time, you know, with this milk toast, slight Republican majority, with the Dems controlling the Senate and Biden in office, I mean, wh what will be the breaks on on spending or on debt issuance or on, um, you know, just new legislation creating crazy new programs? Uh, we, you know, right now, as we speak, we have Congress considering this almost $2 trillion, $1.7 trillion omnibus spending bill uh, to continue funding the government, which has an October 31 to uh, – excuse me, September 30th to October 1st fiscal year. So we're already a couple months behind in terms of creating the, you know, passing the spending for next year. And, and Jose, people may not realize this, but when you get these four or 5,000 page bills, um, which are rushed through Congress, which fund all the various departments and agencies for the coming year, there is so much snuck in there by lobbyists. I mean, there's, when I first worked for Dr. Paul in the early 2000s, there was still a, a, an appropriations, a spending process called regular order. And what that meant is there are 12 separate appropriations bills. Now, they, those fund the various branches and agencies of government. And all 12 of those bills were considered separately, voted on separately as a standalone bill, first by the House, then by the Senate. Then the House and the Senate both appointed what are called conferees, and they met and hashed out a, 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 a conference bill in between them. And all 12 of those conference bills were voted on separately by the House and the Senate in round two. And all that happened before Congress even went home for its August break so that the, the spending for the next year, which began in October, could already be settled. Now, that is, that is so far in the rearview mirror now. I mean, Congress is so far from that process now. And even when there were 12 separate bills, they were still vast. You could never know everything in them. But now where they push them all together into one giant bill and call it an omnibus bill, or when they just break it up into a few uh, larger bills called minibus bills, both of these are incredibly unholy processes. I mean, literally overnight, lobbyists are calling uh, committee staffers on the Hill and saying, hey, insert this language, insert that language. And, you know, nobody can read through all the stuff. And e even if you were to read through it all, even if you were a member of Congress or together with your staff read every page, you can't understand all the little provisions without reference to tons of other existing federal legislation. So you might get to a section that says, you know, uh, uh, you know, U.S. Code Section 32 
you know, 32 U- U.S. Code Section 2001 is hereby amended in subsection, you know, 178. E little I, 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 you know, you'd have to go back and reference that to even know what is being inserted or deleted or changed or amended. So it's really an impossible process. So whenever you hear about Congress passing an omnibus bill, especially right before Christmas, when all these people just want to go home and have a few days off, I mean, it, it, you, you're guaranteed that it's just a terrible, terrible bill. It's a terrible, terrible process. And uh, to see Zelensky on Capitol Hill clamoring for his uh, 47 billion or, or whatever is in it. I mean, um, wow, you know, I go, okay, I guess that's his Christmas present. Um, really, really terrible. So, I, you know, 2023, I think, shapes up to, to be, um, uh, gosh, a war of attrition where everyone's just going to be positioning themselves uh, to figure out the, the 2024 election. And, and it's ironic that I guess it's ironic in a sick way, the way uh, so much of our lives now um, becomes political, becomes centered around this damnable process. You know, we we all need a break, I think, and and hopefully Christmas and New Year at least provide a a respite. And yeah, to uh, cap things off, in light of the political and economic chaos around us, what what do you believe is the most practical strategy for libertarians, paleoconservatives, and other disaffected people on like on the right or free market, pro free market people uh, to pursue if they want to restore some semblance of sanity wherever they reside in? Well, that's just it. Liberty, if we properly understand it, is is simply the ability. Um, for markets to operate and for humans to live their la- lives largely without state interference. It's not a philosophy. It's not an ideology. I don't think liberty is an ideology. And I don't think it's, it certainly isn't liberation theology or self-actualization, uh, which, which is how it tends to be portrayed by libertarians. I, I think um, you just have to understand this isn't a numbers game. I mean, millions upon millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of Americans believe things that are distinctly untrue about the operation of government and money and central banks. So, are, you know, given the resources and time available to us, you know, is the goal to persuade them, to persuade 51% of them, or, or, or ought we to be moving towards uh, a more decentralized future where hopefully – there can be countries around the world or, or maybe even states within the United States which are proving the case for a greater degree of economic freedom as opposed to trying to make this case persuasively. You know, read read human action and you'll understand. Most people aren't going to read human action and most people choose not to understand. So I really think separation is the project in front of us, uh, much more so than persuasion. I mean, we continue to work on young people, of course, but um, – very few people truly change their worldview once they reach middle age. I mean, this is this is true in psychology, in human sociology, you know. Um, and so what we want to do is to try to – if we can't depoliticize society, we ought to at least be able to denationalize it so much, to defederalize it so much and have, and have more uh, of what happens decided uh, – more on the state and local level. I think that's that's where the promise lies. I think that's where the hope lies. And let's face it, Uncle Sam is never going to be able to deal with its its political problems. There's no there's no interest in doing so. There's no incentive to do so. Politicians get elected at the federal level uh, for their ability to give us stuff now, which we or future generations will pay for later. So. The incentives are all wrong at the federal level. So we should ought to, ought to work on creating the right incentives at the state and local level. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. And in the meantime, you can find more content like this at Mises.org.